says workshop, this is actually really more of a, a talk, although we will have time at the end for questions um, about what we've done here. Uh, so this is a talk where I'll be doing some of the presentation and then Athena will be doing uh, the rest. Uh, so I'll start with an introduction about what we're doing here. So we're talking about machine learning, uh, coupling that to Fortran. Machine learning, as we've seen, I think, in quite a few of the talks today and yesterday, uh, is pretty ubiquitous at the moment. Uh, it's spreading into scientific and engineering applications. And that's largely because there's just huge amounts of data coming along, and um, this has given rise to the ability to process these models. And also, the models themselves have advanced in uh, sophistication, and the hardware has been available to run them very effectively. We've seen examples from bursary funded projects, uh, we've seen SACIP, uh, M squared lines, and DataWave all uh, either bringing in machine learning models to replace or help with their parameterizations, uh, either with the existing parameterizations or perhaps moving on to data driven uh, machine learning models as well. Uh, so how do people do this? Uh, not many people told us how they do this. Uh, generally, the machine learning models themselves are trained in one of two, maybe three, frameworks, TensorFlow and PyTorch, Scikit-Learn is, is out there as well. And this is a problem because most scientific applications, many scientific applications, not most, I apologize about it, uh, many scientific applications are written in uh, statically uh, compiled languages, so C++ and Fortran are very common in this domain. So how do we bridge these two requirements, um, well, that's what we're going to tell you. So current approaches, uh, a quite popular and common one is 4Pi. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about this. We're now just talking about Fortran, by the way, not C++. The common approach is 4Pi, uh, and that has advantages. It's very simple. You just take a file and drop it into your application. Um, you can then bring Python types into Fortran. You can call Python functions from Fortran. But the disadvantage is you've basically brought the entire Python interpreter into your, uh, into your application, and that has a certain overhead. And as data is passed between uh, the Fortran layer and the Python layer, you have to be quite careful to avoid lots of redundant copies. There's something called the Fortran Keras bridge, uh, which is just Keras only. And as far as we can tell, that's basically a sort of Fortran re-implementation of Keras uh, directly into Fortran. So that's, you would eventually get um, quite high performance using strongly compiled, well, compiled Fortran. Um, the disadvantage is uh, it doesn't look like it's currently being worked on, and it's always going to be playing catch up with Keras because you've got Keras and TensorFlow adding new types and new layers and things. And so you'd have to then wait for those to be implemented in Fortran. And there's something we've seen called Smart Sim, um, which is really about passing data between uh, processes. So, for example, you might have a simulation that's running in Fortran, and another part of your code is running uh, Python uh, machine learning code, and they're effectively separate processes. And Smart Sim will handle passing the data between the two, um, effectively over a network or a network-like connection. Um, this structurally seems quite different from the way that a lot of people write an application to then call into a machine learning model. So we haven't really given it a huge amount of attention. Uh, we think you know, it might be interesting, but it just looks quite different. So our approach um, is going to be directly coupling Fortran code to TensorFlow or PyTorch. So we're not going to be passing through the Python library at all. We're going to be going straight into the, the guts of these machine learning uh, libraries. And so that means you don't have any overhead passing into Python, and you don't have to worry about linking into the Python interpreter in your, your build, which is just one fewer thing to worry about. So now I'm going to talk about uh, Fortran to TensorFlow, and then Athena will talk about Fortran to PyTorch. Um, so TensorFlow, we're talking about TensorFlow 2, of course, uh, with also it sort of incorporates or has absorbed Keras, uh, so kind of the same thing. It's an extremely performant uh, library, runs GPUs, CPUs, and so on and so on. The back end of TensorFlow is C++, um, and it presents a Python, C++, and a C interface. The Python interface 
many of you are probably quite familiar with that. That's generally how people play with uh, TensorFlow. It's very performant, very nice. The C++ interface is slightly different to the Python interface for reasons. Um, I don't know that many people use that, but that's it's similar to the Python interface. And the C interface is not. <laughs> The C interface is different, right? So why do we want the C interface? Well, calling C uh, functions from Fortran is now easy since Fortran 2003 uh, with module ISO C binding. If any of you are old like me, you might remember when it was a, a horrifying nightmare, but now it isn't, so that's yay. Um, unfortunately, the TensorFlow C interface is not good. Um, it's kind of weird, it's not overly well documented. The documentation basically points you to the .h file, which is not great documentation. Um, the interface itself seems to span TensorFlow 1 and 2. There's little bits of stuff which you can see came from TensorFlow 1. There's other things which make it work with TensorFlow 2. It does use the TensorFlow 2 under the hood, so it's, it's not TensorFlow 1, but it, it, the interface itself is sort of clumsy. Um, for example, there's one major problem. Uh, you can't load a model without knowing what's in the model using the C interface, but you can't know what's in the model without loading the model. And yeah, that's kind of weird. Um, we have got around that by basically having a glue code, sorry, it's not, I shouldn't say glue code, but it's a, a separate script, a Python script, which will process the model and output the required Fortran with the required parameters that you need to know uh, to load that particular model. Um, and then there's some glue Fortran code which will wrap around the TensorFlow C library to make it uh, slightly easier to call uh, from Fortran. Uh, and we've only implemented enough to load and infer from the model. You're not going to be training models in Fortran, I hope, because I really think that would just be a bad idea. Use the Python to train the model, and then you can infer from it and load it using this interface. So the design, we've got some types um, which might not look too different to the Python type. Some of them are a little bit extra because of this slightly odd interface. So there's graph and session, which define the model. Um, there's status, there's tensors, of course, and output. So those are now Fortran types, which are effectively just wrapping the C types. Uh, there's some functions, which you use a different module to pull in. Uh, and these basically follow the format of the C interface. That seems to be the most sensible thing to do. Um, yeah, I've already said that. Uh, the, the glue code just does some sort of nice things like making sure the strings are Fortran or C compatible and some pass between the layers, handles arrays, things like that. Uh, when you're passing data into the model to infer, you're going to be using these TF tensor types, uh, which we've only implemented, implemented as no copy references to the Fortran arrays. So this will be performant, but um, you have to be a little careful because the Fortran array is the data to the tensor, so you don't want to be basically changing the underlying Fortran array while you're in TensorFlow or vice versa. I don't think you're going to want to do that. Balancing question. How are you handling the major versus column major? We'll come to that. <laughs> Balancing ask about row major, column major, and we will come to that. Um, and because you're linking into a C library, you are responsible for deallocating the objects. So once you've allocated something, you must remember at some point to delete it. Uh, if you don't, you'll get a memory leak, and eventually over time that will probably cause problems. Uh, so for example, you made a tensor, you call TF delete tensor when you're done with it. So for the pre-processing the model, uh, how legible is that? That is quite legible. Uh, it doesn't really need to be legible, that's just the help text of the script. Um, you know, the model for TensorFlow should be in the Keras saved model format. That's pretty much the standard TensorFlow saved model format, uh, saving a model format now. If you do have an HDF5 model, you can convert it into a saved model format. It's not hard. Um, so this utility will basically load and process the model from within Python and output uh, the Fortran code that would be necessary to load and infer the machine learning model. It uh, is a work in progress. So it will generate a module which will contain something to initialize the module, which will also load in the, the network networks. 
and then the necessary stuff to load in tensors, infer, and then deinitialize at the end. There'll be some things that the code won't do, such as how you're going to scale or reshape the arrays, because there's a lot of different ways that you can do that, and why you may or may not want to do that. And so we just leave that up to the user. There'll be comments in the code to say, do it here. And you'll need to know which of the inputs on your model correspond to which of the arrays you're going to be passing in uh, are which, basically. So that's just about legible. You don't worry too much about it uh, in terms of what it's saying. So, right, so we're generating a module, we're storing the the networks, the models, in these pairs of variables here. So this particular example, I'm loading in two models. Uh, the example is from WaveNet, which is from DataWave. Um, well, we're loading in WaveNet, which is a DataWave project, uh, which Aditi uh, talked about uh, yesterday. And that has two models, two networks in it, uh, basically from the different wind directions. So the code will be able to process a model which has, or you can say I want to load in two models into my module. Um, and then, so for example, these tags that you can see mentioned here, these are some of the secret information that you can't get without looking in the model, but which you need to know to be able to load the model. Um, I think it's just a default thing nowadays, but at some point in Keras's intense flows history, that did something useful. It's not clear what, because it's not well documented. If you, you can go down the path and try and find out, but I just got lost. Uh, so again, you're, you've got the path names to the directories with containing the models. These are currently hard-coded here, and there's a comment saying, you probably don't want to hard-code these here. You probably want to load them in from the configuration file or something like that. And then there'll be a load model routine, which will actually load in the model. And of course, it's a template in a sense. Um, it will compile, but it's, it's code that you're expected to modify and edit. So looking at some of the detail of what that load model script will do, this is now work in progress, and this isn't quite the same. But this is one of the interface functions that, are, that wraps around the C interface. And you can see basically that it needs these tags to be able to load the model. This is the only way you can load the model. So just to show that I'm not going crazy, you do need to know what's in it before you can load it. And we get a status back in this SAP variable, which we can examine and see whether things went well or not, and do something appropriate, stop in this case, if something went wrong. Uh, for the input data, we've got this TF new tensor call, which will return a TF tensor type, these Fortran types. And you can see here, I'm using CLOCK to pass in a C pointer to a Fortran array. Now there is a way actually of passing in a Fortran array directly and having the TF tensor code generate the requisite um, pointer itself, but that requires a Fortran 2018 feature, which I'm not sure is widely supported. So I think that is, is overloaded. You can do either. Uh, but that's a Fortran array in a particular layout in memory. Uh, it'll be however you set it up in memory. Right? I mean, the row major column major is also. It, it, it depends on, it, well, I'll come to that in a minute. It will depend on your application, really, how that's important. Um, and it's a no copy call, so this just gets you basically a reference within the tensor to that data. And I've got two of them because uh, this particular model takes two inputs. There's some bookkeeping that you have to do, which is another of these magic uh, strings that you just need to know. Uh, serving default input under bar one obviously is the name of the input for one of the inputs, and obviously has index zero. Um, some of this you will need to know what input that actually corresponds to. Is it this temperature, or is it this wind tensor that I'm going to be feeding in? Um, but this guff, the script will generate for you. Sorry, I wasn't going to say guff, I was going to say book. And then you will call session run. And again, some of this will be wrapped by the, the script. And session run will take the input tensors and return some output tensors. And these input TF output and output TF output things just say where those inputs should go and where the outputs will be coming from in case you have multiple inputs and outputs. 
the output tensors is allocated within TensorFlow. Now, it would be lovely if I could pass in a Fortran allocated piece of memory and have the tensor wrap around it and then basically get rid of the tensor and keep the Fortran allocated memory and happily run off into the rest of my code. But the first thing that <coughs> session run does is it obliterates this output tensor's pointer. So at the moment, you can't do that. You just have to take the output tensor's allocated memory. So the simplest way of dealing with that is you just copy the data into a new Fortran array. You can do funny things with the, the ISOC binding uh, C to Fortran pointer calls. And how exactly I'm going to handle that inside the script, I don't know yet, to try and make it easy for people. But um, there, there are tricks you can do if you want to really be clever. But, no, no, not but. So what about things like scaling? Um, often with networks, you scale the data, you set the mean zero, and you send a deviation of one, and you can do all that. Well, OK, you can do that. You can do it in a model. That's not normally recommended, but I think for an inference-only model, it, it might be OK. Um, if you're doing it in something like 4Pi, OK, you're using NumPy. That's moderately performant, right? OK, that's good. So you could do it in Fortran as well, just directly writing a scaling code. Or you, I suppose you could use BLAS if you wanted to. Um, but that, you know, that would also be nicely performed. What about reshaping the data? So in terms of row major, column major, you may have multiple issues there. In a sense, when you're, what you pass into the tensor construction is a pointer. So how the data is arranged and what the, what the model expects, it doesn't really matter whether it's coming from Fortran or C, it's just how it sits in memory. But you have to kind of be aware of that. So for example, in WaveNet, uh, WaveNet has a, an XY grid, and in each grid there is a, a stack of atmospheric levels. And it's been trained by being given inputs on each of those levels and providing an output for those levels for the gravity wave forcing. So in a sense, it only operates on a single grid point. You can give it as many examples as you like, and it will go away and produce many outputs. So but it expects the data that is being handed to be the level 0, level 1, level 2 from the first grid point, and then level 0, level 1, level 3 from the second grid point, and so on, and so on, and so on. The code that's running with this Calling into WaveNet called MIMA doesn't do that. It stores all the level zeros for all the grid points and all the level ones for all the grid points and so on. So it's it's the wrong way around. The data's the wrong way around. So you have to reshape it. So in the four by approach, they do not, uh, a Benendi array reshape call. Uh, in Fortran, you just explicitly do it yourself. Well, I suppose you could call it reshape. Um, there's also a, a wrinkle where, for some reason, WaveNet is trained as a real time score, and means it's all running in real time's eight. So you're going to copy your data. You can't do anything else. Reshaping is not performant. You can, it's not performant in the sense that it's a sort of wasted operation. Why am I reshaping this data? It's wasting, wasting time. So if you can use intrinsics for a library function, but if you are scaling the data and reshaping it, there's a little win here. You can reshape and scale at the same time. So you would write the scaling data and then just change the indices of the arrays to get the data in the format that the model expects when you construct that tensor. Yeah, it's not mega performance, because obviously you're going to be cache missing on one of those arrays, but what can you do? You've got to do it. Um, but we suspect that's actually where some of the wins are, are going to come from, is things like this, where you can basically compress the code, and take advantage of things that you know in your Fortran side are true about the code, and the, uh, sorry, true about the data um, that you have. So I think we'll go straight on to Athena now, and then do questions for everything at the end, yeah? I think that makes sense. You could have some now about this specific thing while it's fresh, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. And then do more later as well. So any questions about the TensorFlow bit? People no. using TensorFlow in there. So one question I, I might have is, you talked a bit primarily talking from 
Porton to a TensorFlow model. Yes. I would expect that most people have the other problem, that they want to incorporate some piece of Fortran into a bigger pattern that might have been written in TensorFlow. Um, well, really? The pattern's written in TensorFlow. Um, well, like they have a Python code and they want to indicate some Fortran pieces and then they want to head up the data to Python. That, I think that's really a separate use case. Yeah, I would, I, I would argue that's a very separate use case because yeah, you're then basically treating the, for, the Fortran function or module or whatever it is as a separate blob that you can call in. Um, yeah, this isn't going to help you there. So this is really about encapsulating a model as something that you can run directly from the Fortran. Yeah. OK. Can people hear me? No? Yes? Is it okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you could, if you could, yeah, maybe on your lanyard. present, let's say, our corresponding solution for PyTorch. Uh, this is more of a proof of concept. It's less mature, I'd say, than the TensorFlow um, approach because we don't actually have a use case yet for it. Uh, hopefully, we will. Um, so PyTorch, of course, is a, a very popular deep learning framework. Uh, I think it's, um, uh, at least it's, most people, most machine learning scientists I know use PyTorch actually, not TensorFlow. Um, and I think that's a good thing, <laughs> as we will see. Um, yes, so uh, the PyTorch team at some point uh, decided that for deployment at least, it doesn't make sense to use their the vanilla uh, uh, PyTorch models in Python. Uh, they decided that it's best that, at least for deployment, for performance reasons mostly, and portability reasons, that you should be able um, to decouple your model completely from the uh, Python environment. So um, this was both for portability and performance reasons. So performance-wise, um, they decided that um, uh, that there's like multitude uh, um, that there are many um, optimizations you can do uh, at the at the level uh, at the execution graph layer uh, um, that you can do though that you cannot do in Python basically right so you you kind of need to do this uh, at the C plus plus level so they kind of introduced uh, a JIT framework which is called PyTorch JIT which tries basically to, to do this, to take the original um, model in Python, optimize its execution graph, and generate optimized code for, for the target platform. So there are basically two components. One is Torch Script, which is kind of a statically typed subset of Python that is useful in their minds for machine learning. So they call it Torch Script. It's, it's basically a subset of Python. Uh, and the second part, of course, is the, the JIT framework. So for anybody who doesn't know what JIT is, it's just-in-time compilation, basically. Right? And uh, there are basically two ways in PyTorch to convert your original model, um, your vanilla PyTorch, let's say, model, to uh, an optimized model for inference. One is called tracing, uh, and the other one is called uh, scripting. So uh, I will show you here an example. So for, for tracing, the approach with tracing is that you basically take the original model, uh, give it a dummy input, right? And the tracer basically records all of the operations uh, uh, um, that happen during a forward pass, right? Um, and then basically builds uh, an optimized execution graph 
uh, which is then compiled into optimized code, okay? So that's, that's what the tracer does. So the problem with the tracer is that if you have models that have a control flow, so this is very common, for example, in um, language models, uh, then you can't use tracing, right? Because tracing, it will only take you through one path, right? Because you give it one input, so it will go through one path of your model. So if you have these types of models, you basically can't use uh, tracing. So uh, what you need to do in that case uh, is use scripting, basically, where the idea here uh, is that you take your original model, uh, written in PyTorch, uh, and basically convert it to Torch script, right? So you might, you might not have to change anything, actually. It might be the case that your model is simple, and basically its implementation um, in Torch script is the same as the implementation in, uh, uh, in PyTorch. Um, so let's assume that this is our case. So the only thing we, we need to do in that case is instead of the tracer, use the script compiler, right? So uh, you can see it at the code snippet on the right, for example. So let's say this, let's say this is our model, okay? So here is our model with its forward function. Um, and what we do here basically is we just pass in to the JIT script compiler the model, right? Um, so it, it's quite simple. Uh, but of course, if your model uh, cannot be implemented directly in Torch script because you are using some feature that is not supported, uh, then you might slightly need to work on your original model, right? So for example, I've seen, um, I've seen a blog where some people were trying to convert their model to Torch script. Uh, and because they were dynamically allocating tensors in the forward, pass, they had to change that. So in TorchScript, for example, everything needs to be pre-allocated, all of the tensors you use. So that is one thing, for example, you might need to change. Uh, but um, I, I think that it, it, in most cases, there are ways to address this. Like it's, you might just need to work a bit on the original model. Uh, uh, yes, and also I've seen that actually the, the script compiler gives you very uh, helpful messages actually to 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 um, address any issues you have. So of course the problem here is that you might end up having to maintain two models, right? One in original in vanilla PyTorch and the other one in Torch script. But not necessarily. You might just in the end use the one for inference, right? The one written in Torch script. Um, right. So. Um, after you've either traced or scripted your model, basically um, what you need to do is serialize it, right? So this is also very simple. You just call torch jit save, uh, and basically this creates an archive format that later on you will use um, in your um, uh, uh, in the application that wants to deploy the model, right? Um, so uh, the issue here is that. Uh, because the goal from the beginning was to decouple uh, the inference, the deployment from the uh, Python environment, uh, the PyTorch people have basically written a C++ uh, library called libtorch that allows you to do this. Uh, so the next step basically after you've um, optimized and saved your model is to actually use libtorch to do uh, the inference. So uh, the, the, the C++ interface, libtorch basically, is very similar to PyTorch. Usually like there's a one-to-one -one mapping of the function, so it's, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to use, actually. So here I have an example um, of basically taking a vanilla PyTorch model uh, and using either the tracer or the script compiler uh, to uh, optimize it and save it um, and serialize it, basically. So here, uh, I'm just taking uh, like a pre-trained model from Torch Vision, uh, and what am I doing? I don't know, is this visible? Is it okay? Not really. Okay. 
Okay, so step one, let's say, is to take our model. Here I'm just using a pre-trained model for storage prediction. The next step, uh, which is actually uh, important, uh, is to set it in evaluation mode. So this basically says that this model will be used for inference. Um, and then the first approach, as I said, is either to do tracing, uh, which is fine for ResNet, tracing works as well, uh, where basically we define a dummy input, right, and pass it in to the uh, tracer. So we basically call JIT uh, torch up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So people can be better now. So yes, we, we just like load our model. Load our model. In this case, this would be just your model, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, we set it in evaluation mode, right? That's actually important. And then we either trace it, if possible, or script it. So um, for tracing, as I said, we need to give a dummy input, right? that should be representative of what we will be doing for uh, inference. So what we do basically is we pass in the model and the input to the tracer, right? Uh, um, and what it produces basically is um, uh, a traced model. Let's just call it a traced model. So an extra thing you can do, and I suggest you always do, but you don't have to actually, but it gives you good performance, is to actually also use the optimized for inference um, feature from the JIT uh, API. Uh, this actually um, gives you a huge performance benefit in some cases. So anyway, this is option one, tracing. If it works, just use tracing. The second option, scripting, it doesn't need an input, right? Because you just you're putting your model in charge with basically. So here, because ResNet you don't need to make any changes to ResNet when moving from PyTorch to TorchScript. You just use the same model. It just works out of the box, right? You just pass in the original ResNet model, and it works. Um, can you? Yeah. <laughs> just so I can show that there is a difference in performance in some cases. I have some results here for, uh, take some time. Yeah, so here, for example, uh, here, I've actually um, benchmarked this model, right? Uh, this is the vanilla PyTorch model on CPU and GPU, and the, the, the let's say, optimized model, the TorchCurve model, again, uh, on CPU and GPU. And you can see that on the CPU, at least, there's almost a 2x difference in performance, right, from using this uh, JIT approach in PyTorch. So it's something, regardless of the coupling, Right? This is like a completely independent thing. But you should do this in general, right? When you want to deploy uh, PyTorch models. Um, right. So, um, yes, so uh, how do we end up like deploying these models in Fortran? Basically, we follow the same approach that Simon introduced earlier. But in this case, we have an extra layer of indirection. Because PyTorch only has a C++ API, we need to go first, we need to create a C wrapper, let's say, API, and then glue that into Fortran. Uh, yes, so again, this is kind of a proof of concept, so we only have what's necessary to just define tensors, load the model, and infer the model. Um, so we touched on this earlier, this is kind of the row major versus column major issue. So if you can't basically rewrite your Fortran application to uh, give the right, um, let's say, ordering for the, uh, the trained model, then basically you can't avoid um, the reshaping. So yeah, it's something you might have to do in the end. Um, right. So here, I basically give an example of using um, uh, our, our equivalent PyTorch Fortran module. So it's actually quite simple. Am I missing a slide here? Oh, these were reordered. OK. These were somehow reordered. OK, let's go to this one first. Um, so right, let's say I want to do inference for my model in Fortran. 
basically what I do is I load our PyTorch with same module. Uh, and then similar to kind of the TensorFlow API, you have like a type that describes the model uh, and a type that describes the tensors, okay? So here I have a single model, an input and an output tensor. Um, then basically what I do here is I just define Fortran arrays for the input and output data. Uh, and their shapes, dimensions, etc. Not recording them at the moment. Um, yes, and then oh, sorry. And then things are actually quite simple. I allocate my four twin arrays, and then what do I do? I pass in these four twin arrays, right, to basically uh, uh, PyTorch tensors. So I use this torch tensor from blob thing function basically uh, to create a PyTorch tensor that uses this data, right? The data from the, the Fortran arrays. Uh, yes, so uh, after I've created my input and output tensors, so in this case, note that we can pre-allocate the output tensor, right? Uh, which was not the case in uh, the TensorFlow API. Here we can't do that. Um, right, and then we just call our uh, module load function to call that to uh, call uh, the uh, the optimized model uh, to initialize it. Sorry, and then we just call the module forward function to do the inference. So I think it's less, uh, it's it's much cleaner I think than the the TensorFlow API. You just create your tensors, load your model, forward pass, and then again you need to do your cleanup of course because it's the same concept. Um, with TensorFlow. So yeah, I think it, it's much simpler. Um, right. So you might notice here that I am using, I'm using here something called Torch KCPU. Uh, this is because here, basically I wanted to inference on the CPU. However, you might want to inference on the GPU. So in that case, Basically, what you need to do to adapt your code, well, there are two things you need to do. On the Python side of things, before you convert your model uh, to TorScript, you basically need to transfer it to the device, right? Uh, so you basically need to first transfer your model to the GPU and then do all of the scripting or tracing or whatever you did, whatever we showed earlier. So that is the one thing you need to do on the Python side of things. And then on the Fortran side of things, if you're using CUDA Fortran, for example, you would just use device here to make sure your um, arrays are allocated on the device. And basically, yeah, you just initialize your GPU um, arrays from CPU arrays, and then nothing else changes, right? You just change, you just change this label from Torch K CPU to Torch K CUDA. So it's, it's quite simple, I think, even to use the, the GPU. Um, yes. So, yes, so that was the PyTorch part. Um, overall, I think, I think we both agree with this, me and Simon, uh, that the TensorFlow API is a bit more complicated, let's say, compared to the PyTorch um, approach. So, uh, I think it might be better in general for training if you plan to actually deploy uh, your models and want to achieve high performance. I think it's a better path to use PyTorch compared at least to TensorFlow. Uh, and uh, I believe there are um, scripts that actually convert TensorFlow models to PyTorch models. So even if you have models um, in Keras slash TensorFlow, you can convert them to PyTorch. Um, right. Uh, and also, like Simon, maybe you want to talk about this a bit about the results. And yeah, so my understanding is that um, uh, um, Simon, uh, so he mentioned earlier that he has done some work for WaveNet, right, which is uh, a neural network used in the DataWave project, uh, and uh, they were originally originally using for apply to do the inference of Fortran, and. Simon, using the approach he presented earlier, uh, he actually got uh, very good speed ups 
by switching to our approach um, around, in what was bit. it, 3x? Yeah, but it was that, only in that. Sorry? Only in that particular part of the code. The inference part. Yeah. 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 So, yes. Um, I think this. Uh, is the way to go, right, if you don't want to do anything very complicated. Um, and uh, I think it would be very useful if there are people uh, in other projects that have PyTorch models that they want to deploy in Fortran. Um, uh, uh, we'd be very happy if you actually used um, our modules uh, because that would help us make them more mature, get feedback, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be great. Thanks for waiting. Just started. Using yes, I know DataWave are... The PyTorch ones. Oh, they started uh, training in PyTorch. Okay, okay, good. Okay, excellent. Yes. So, yeah, that's all from my side. Are there any questions? Or are there people who are using PyTorch and, like, have any questions? No? Okay. I know Simon, for example, he, we talked to him yesterday. Simon Driscoll, yeah. Yes, and he's using PyTorch. Yeah, so, so he might be. So that was Simon Driscoll. Uh, we spoke to him yesterday, but unfortunately had to leave um, before today. So we sort of ran through the talk with him. And he'd inadvertently gone down the Fortran Keras bridge by himself. So he was implementing enough of uh, PyTorch, I think directly in Fortran of his own writing to get his code to work. So yeah, that's not a great idea. And so he was happy to sort of uh, hopefully try out our PyTorch interface as well. Yeah, that was kind of reinventing the wheel. He, my understanding is that he was implementing the neural network layers in Fortran without even using existing libraries. Yeah. So yeah, there's no reason to do that. Please don't do that. Yes. Yes, early. Just to mention that you might be interested in our modeling group in the column. Uh, we are using Fortran code, of course, for the ocean modeling. And uh, some people in the team are already using PyTorch, so maybe that's the right way to do. We are involved in the Square Line project where Smart Team was considered to be the answer to our uh, sub-grid scale uh, parameterization, but uh, yes, maybe this could be this case. I think this is simpler. I, I, I'm not sure. Smart Sim is a quite different approach. Yeah. Yes, yes, for, for yeah. what I understand, because I'm not at all in the machine learning side, is that uh, you speak from the machine learning side, and then you go for the uh, physical model, let's say, the torture model. And just matching, maybe it's the other way around. You have the real simulation, and then you call from. Yes, from, from like workers. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Right. Sorry, that's not. Do you want to watch that? No, no, no. Yeah, it, it's a sort of. It's quite an interesting approach. It, it uses a, a Redis worker, or a, a, I think a, a special Redis worker, a smart Redis worker. Uh, to couple various things, in this case, say, a Fortran code and the machine learning in Python. And so it's it's concentrating very much on moving that data to and fro efficiently and rapidly, but it's still effectively passing through either a network or a pseudo network layer. So yeah, that, that adds a layer of complication. Um, we haven't investigated it, so it may well be really clever and good. We just don't know. Um, but it, because it's sort of a different approach to the one that a lot of people have already started down, uh, we didn't really pay, but we didn't really look at it too much. But if, if someone's using it, that would be fascinating because I'd love to see it actually in action. So this is certainly something that we've we've seen is of interest across lots of the Vesri teams and lots of sub projects and subgroups and things are doing 
things that are you know, want this kind of thing. So for the sake of people watching this later, because I know there's a lot of people in the west and east coast of the US who um, are going to watch the recording, they can't be here to so, uh, watch it here now or on the virtual. Um, what should they do if this is something that they're, they're, they want to do or they've started doing? Um, how can they, they go forward with us um, to, to explore this? Well, they can clone our repo to start with. <laughs> we have a link so to the it. Link was it, has, it has examples uh, in it. Uh, so you can actually look at examples of how you would do this. So we have examples. Uh, so Yes. The, yeah, we have the link in the beginning. So I would, start, I would start just by looking at the examples we have in our repository. Uh, yes, and uh, just talk to us. Like, yeah, we are looking for use cases. Like, <laughs> yeah. So they should email someone in the core team, and we'll. we'll yeah. 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 But yeah, it, it's work, as mentioned, uh, Simon told me to mention that it is work in progress, but I've mentioned this before. Like uh, uh, the PyTorch one, again, is, for example, I was telling Simon that it doesn't even have error handling at the moment. So yeah. Yes, Valentin? Yeah, and uh, I hinted at this in uh, my earlier question. If you ever find yourself at, and you feel like you want to rewrite your forking code in PyTorch or TensorFlow, <coughs> you don't need to anymore. Uh, so, like, people do this because they want to have differential models, and there are tools to integrate Fortran, C++, um, codes and do automatic differentiation over these models directly, and then you can put, pull them into your PyTorch model, use them as um, a step, as an example, as a layer in, uh, in, in the analytical code. So, the project that I work on that does this is called Enzyme, and it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's being used for differentiating parallel codes as, as well. It's, a, it's been quite successful in that way. So that is going the other way around. Yes. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So the actual application is written in Python, but it wants to use you. Fortran or C++. You. So let's say you have MIT GCM, yeah. which is a gigantic um, Fortran code, and you want to take parts of it and you want to use machine learning to enhance those parts to do sensitivity, uncertainty, quantification. And so the outer application might be written in Python or Julia. Okay. And uh, what it wants to use these components of these well tested, well understood pieces of code. But in order to um, do anything productive for them that is not just back, back, back box analysis, uh, you want to generate gradients through those models. Mm. And uh, so if you look, uh, there's a whole like resurgence of differential models recently, and so people are quite fluid models and jacks. Um, but then they are like, okay, now how do we go from a fluid model to a climate model? Well, I assemble a team of 50 people, 10 years, and a lot of work. So the question is, can we, can we actually reuse all of <laughs> yes. uh, Can we reuse all of those codes that we already written and uh, use them as differential models as part of scientific machine learning? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Any other questions or comments? Um, so we will have another workshop tomorrow morning that's about training ML models. So if that's something you're interested in learning how to do, that would be a good workshop for you. It's going to go over some of the kind of core groundwork. Um, and if there's something you already know about uh, as well, I think that there could also be some stuff there for you. Um, we've got someone coming who's very experienced in that area. Um, yeah, so that will complement this this nicely as well. Um, but yeah, let's thank Simon and Athena for the talk.